in the beginning of a sermon series, as Melissa asked us, what is next? What's next for us? And it's always good to celebrate what we've done, but to always know that God has more in store for us. So what is next for us in our time of worship is several weeks spent with the story of Esther. It's a series of worship services that will focus on the different characters in the story of Esther. It's uh, one of the most familiar and well-loved stories in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, and um, it's complicated. There are many characters. The plot takes a lot of twists and turns, and I encourage you all to, to spend some time reading the entire book of Esther. It's not a long read. It's actually quite exciting with some of the drama in the story. The, we're just going to read little snippets in the worship service, including today's little piece, which comes from chapter 3. So what has happened up to this point is that the king of the Persian Empire um, has uh, uh, taken for his wife a, a young a Jewish girl whose name is Esther. And Jew, uh, Esther's um, uncle is named Mordecai. So Mordecai and Esther are significant characters at this part of the story, along with the king. And then there's another character to know a little bit about before I read this section, and his name is Haman. And Haman is, uh, he's the bad guy, right? In this story, when we hear Haman's name, we are supposed to boo and hiss. So we get to practice that. Haman. Yeah, oh, yeah see, you got it. He's the bad guy for sure. There's no, there's no question about it. He has been promoted to a pretty high level in the Persian court and has now insisted that all the people would bow down to him and give him obeisance, as, it called, as it's called, obey him, worship him uh, when he, whenever he walks around. And this little part of the story is about what happens when he comes upon Mordecai and what Mordecai chooses to do in that moment. I'm picking it up from chapter 3, and I'll read verses 1 through 6. After, this, uh, after all these things, the king, whose name is pronounced actually Ahasuerus, if you want to pronounce it, but since that's so difficult, we can just refer to him as Elvis. <laughs> king Elvis promoted Haman, good job, and Haman, who was the son of the, that person who lived at that place, <clears throat> who had, and advanced him and set his seat above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants, you can't help it, can you? You just can't help it. And all the king's servants, who were at the king's gate, bowed down and did obeisance to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? When they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would avail, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. But he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Elvis. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, we're calling this series, No Other Life But This, which is an interesting phrase, and it's not an original phrase. It's actually Henry David Thoreau's phrase. He wrote it in his uh, journal in April of 1859. The whole quote is fascinating. It's, it goes this way. You must live in the present. Launch yourself on every wave. Find your eternity in each moment. Fools stand on their island of opportunities and look toward another land. There is no other land. There is no other life but this. And so before going any further, I'll explain what I don't mean 
by there is no other life but this. I don't mean that this earthly life is all there is and that there's nothing that happens to us after we die. I have a colleague, a friend of mine named Norm Meyer, a Presbyterian pastor, and every time there was a death in the congregation, he announced it this way. He would say, such and such has completed this part of their life, right? Meaning, life is a continuum, that this life is that life. From last week, eternal life starts now, right? So there is no other life from this than this means that this moment is all there is. This moment is what God has given us to live that eternal life in the here and now. Find your eternity in every moment. And throughout the story of Esther, people do just that. They seize their moment. They recognize moments and they make an impact. They make a difference or they don't. So when we talk about no other life than this, we're going to be framing this whole series with, with the idea that God's life, the life God gives to us, is right here and right now, ready for us to live. Seize those moments that lie before you. Esther is a story of moments, and each of the characters in Esther either seizes those moments or, or not. If you're not familiar with Esther, you, um, are, and the grow groups are also studying Esther, so please, I hope you're in a grow group, and this would be sort of review for you. But just in general, Esther's about a young girl who is living far, far away from Jerusalem. She's a Jewish um, girl and uh, has been taken, her family was taken away from Jerusalem in the great exile. The exile is over, and many families have returned home, but, but several, many, many Jewish people live well outside of the bounds of of Israel, including here in the capital of the Persian Empire. And the king, um, King Elvis, he needs a new wife because his first wife displeased him, so he sent her away. Um, he's also not a very savory character, by the way. We'll talk about him next week a little bit. But um, he needs a new wife, and so he does this sort of Google search for a new wife and um, comes up with Esther and marries Esther, and she becomes the queen. And, and we read today about the, the crux of the whole story, the conflict in the story. That is Haman, who has made this great decree, right, that all the Jewish people should be exterminated from the land just because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, because one person wouldn't bow down to him. He said, wipe them all out. So, so the story proceeds along, and we'll hear about the king, and we'll hear about, about what Esther does with that in a couple of weeks. But today, today, let's look a little bit more closely at Mordecai himself. This, this moment that, that Mordecai seizes is only one of, of many for him in this story. The bad guy, Haman, has come out to say, here I am, take a look at me. You know, there's, there's two ways to walk into a room. Some people walk into a room and say, here I am. Other people walk into a room and go, oh, there you are. Uh, Haman's one of those persons that goes, here I am. And he walks into the room and Mordecai stands there and will not bow down to him, refuses to do so. This makes Haman pretty angry. But Mordecai has taken this moment, sees this moment, and he knows what is the right thing to do. We don't know particularly why Mordecai made that decision. Why did Mordecai make the decision to stand tall? It's not made explicit in the scripture passage itself. Maybe it's because of his faith. Maybe he knew that to bow down to an, a person would be sacrilegious. Don't know that for sure. Maybe he just didn't particularly care for Haman. I mean, we don't like him. I already told you you're not supposed to like him. Isn't it nice to be told who you're not supposed to like? <laughs> um, Haman's uh, family and Mordecai's family, those two peoples, were enemies and had been for generations. Haman was an Amalekite. Mordecai was a Jew. And the Amalekites and the Jews just did not get along. There are Hatfields and McCoys all throughout um, their, their history. And so here's two people that, you know, by hereditary rights should not get along. So who knows why it was, but for whatever reason, Mordecai stands tall. Mordecai takes a stand and, and, does, and does what is right and refuses to bow down. Whatever his reasons were, we know it's a part of his character. We know that it's sort of woven into who he is because we know that that's how the whole story starts out. 
Mordecai's cousin or relative of some kind is, is Esther. And Esther has been orphaned. And as a young girl, Mordecai takes a stand and does the right thing and adopts her. He brings her up as his own daughter. Right off the bat, we see Mordecai making a decision to do the right thing. There's another time during the story when Mordecai learns about an assassination plot against King Elvis. He alerts the king and prevents that assassination from happening, saving someone's life, taking a stand, doing the right thing, standing up for what is right. It's a part of who he is. It's just a part of his identity to stand up and to do the right thing, to recognize those moments and to make the right choice. I know it's hard for us, isn't it? It's hard in the mix and confusion and complexity of our lives to be able to discern those moments. And sometimes we think this might be a moment we could do this or we might be able to say this or what if we said this other thing and it's hard to know what is the right thing to do. It's hard to discern what God wants us to be doing. And sometimes we think about taking a stand as being making a bold statement about some kind of moral issue. But it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be siding on one side or another of any given moral issue. It can be as simple as, as helping someone who needs help. It could be as simple as doing what 140 of us plus did yesterday, being out and about in the community, serving in nine different places, making a difference, just a small difference, it could be as simple as putting together a meal and adding that to the hundreds of other meals that have been produced to be shared with people who are hungry. It could be as simple as handing a, a refreshment to a bicyclist as they go by riding on the MS-150. It could be as simple as where, where I was and where we were yesterday taking clothes off of uh, hangers, summer clothes, and putting winter clothes on. So we were taking these little three T-sized tank tops off and folding them and putting on these three T-sized sweatshirts on hangers at Sammy's Window, which, which is a ministry for foster kids in our county. And, and I couldn't help but think as I was doing that, that there's going to be a foster kid, a size three T foster kid, who walks in here needing a sweatshirt this fall. And they're going to find one that we hung on those hangers yesterday, and they're going to have no idea that I did that, that we did that, that we spent three hours in the morning making that exchange. Because, because you see, it's not about recognition or acknowledgement or making some kind of grand statement. When you take a stand for Christ, it's making a difference in someone else's life. It's thinking about someone else before yourself. It, it's not rec asking for recognition for yourself, but recognizing something, some issue, some problem, some situation in the world that's not as God wants it to be, and then working to change that, to change the world, one 3T sweatshirt at a time. When people join a United Methodist Church, we say something. We say some pretty serious things. For everyone who's a member of Campbell or of any other United Methodist Church, in the United Methodist membership questions, there's this promise. We promise to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. That's legit. To resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form it presents itself, that is what it means. To take a stand. To stand up for Christ. With Christ as our cause, that can be expressed in any number of ways, any number of small gestures. With Christ as the cause, with, with Christ as the underlying principle, I mean, it's our mission as the church of Jesus Christ to help people become disciples of Jesus Christ who are changing the world for God's sake. I love the for God's sake part. Take a stand for God's sake. Take a stand for God's sake means to me, it can mean two things, right? Take a stand or make a change for God's sake. For God's sake can be telling us what kind of change is going to be made, right? You can change the world in a number of ways. We need to be changing the world for God's sake. 
but it also can emphasize the commandment, right? Take a stand for God's sake. It came up frequently in my household, you know. Uh, clean your room for God's sake. I never really understood why <laughs> cleaning your room for, was for God's sake. But <clears throat> for God's sake, clean your room. For God's sake, flush the toilet when you're done. Well, that one I get. But, um, <laughs> but what we're doing as followers of Jesus Christ is taking a stand for God's sake. For the sake of justice. For the sake of love. For the sake of salvation. For the sake of forgiveness. For the sake of Jesus Christ. We are standing up to change something for the better, to make something that God doesn't want to be into something that God does, to see a circumstance in this world that is not as God intends it to be, and to work our hardest to change it, to make it better. That's what Mordecai was able to do throughout the story of Esther, to see a moment, to recognize it, and to seize that moment, to take a stand for God's sake. And that's our challenge as followers of Jesus Christ, to discern in each and every moment. It could be this afternoon. It, it could be this week at work. It could be at the store when you go shopping for groceries or wherever it might be. Be ready to seize, to discern those moments, and then take a stand for God's sake. Do something to change the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing as followers of Jesus Christ. It's no less than the mission of the church itself. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, may we see the moments. May we recognize the potential in each moment, the promise in each moment, the hope in each moment. And may we realize that possibility with our actions, with our words. Help us to understand what it truly means to say that there is no day but today. There is no moment but this one. There is no other life but this. And then help us, empowered by your living presence, to stand up for you. This we pray to you in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.